Um, so hi, um, I'm Patrick, and for now I'm still on the community platform engineering team. As of coming Monday, I won't be, and I'll be working on its IoT security. So yeah, it, a lot of this is what we're currently planning to do. Um, so we'll see where, like, how much of it goes right. Um, So, IoT, there should have been a word Fedora before it, um, because IoT has a lot of meanings for a lot of people. There are people who have smart thermostats, there are people who, like, see it as a, I, I want to play media on my TV, and there's people who do things like, controlling oil and gas platforms. I mean, that might not be the same kind of uh, uh, use case. For Fedora IoT, we're usually meaning, uh, leaning towards the, the larger scope of the spectrum. I think that we try not to focus on like your random $5 gadget that happens to have a Wi-Fi connection. Um, but more serious things. So, uh, one of the things that is always amusing with security in computers is, but why would I need to worry about someone touching my server? It's in a data center. And yeah, um, how can someone get access to it? Why is this grub bug which lets me bypass security by hitting enter 50 times? a terrible issue. I mean, nobody will get access to my server, there's a lock on my cage. Yeah, and now try doing that for an oil rig or a light pole where someone can just walk up and just grab the machine out of it. Um, that is kind of a different attack vector that usually hasn't been looked at a lot in the past. So. That's what we're currently trying to, like, how are we going to deal with some of that? Because if we ever want to get bigger customers to use this stuff in production, we probably want a reasonable answer to the, uh, um, to what you, how you secure that stuff. So for boot time, um, this is a, a like the system we're currently intending to use, it you want to make sure that what your system boots is like the thing you intend to boot, and not someone grabbed your device and snuck in their own SD card. And oops, now we've got a compromised system on our network that might not be appreciated in a industrial environment. So. We're planning to use secure boot there. Um, <laughs> some people might know about it. Um, basically, verify all of the parts of the boot process as it's being booted. Um, and in addition, measure it, um, which means that you take a checksum of what is being booted. So when a remote, when you wanna try to connect to something, you can prove what is running on the platform and uh, um, have the servers actually trust that you are not a compromised device. Now, of course, there's also some data that you might wanna put on there where you want it to be unavailable if someone, instead of push it, puts their own SD card in your device, grabs your SD card out and plugs it into your laptop um, so I don't know how many people have heard of Clevis. It's a way to tie in different uh, um, sealing mechanisms to a disk or to provide disk encryption passphrase automatically to Lux on boot. It's because for crypto. sorry. It's pam for crypto. <laughs> it's yeah. say again. It's pam. Right. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. That's a reasonable summary. Um, because 
for some reason, having to enter a password on every device you have on every boot tends not to be appreciated very well. It tends to be a bunch of manual labor that people might not prefer. It's okay if it's a laptop. Yeah, but <laughs> if it's... Well, you end, up with, you end up with other security problems, like now you have people writing the password on a sticky note and sticking it to the device. Yeah. <laughs> or, Which is your best case scenario. <laughs> or, or the device being stuck out in a desert somewhere attached to an oil pump. Right. Um, and the sticky note is... And, 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 and someone having to drive out and plug in a keyboard and monitor to be able to put in the... Yep. There were four words driving up, not knowing they needed the keyboard. Yes. <laughs> I didn't understand correctly. Like, the threat model here in the previous slides is the previous slide is somebody stealing the device, and here instead is somebody stealing the storage, but not the device. Um, it's either where you steal the, the, the storage or the device. Um, the whole attack is like, it is entirely possible for someone to get this black to the machine. Um, this encryption is usually used because there is company confidential data that you need to store on there with algorithms and stuff that you want to compute on the nodes. Um, you really don't want those to lead to an attacker um, because there's actual intellectual property tied up in the algorithms. Okay, That's so, hard. so the encryption for this is a different type of model than the one that you showed before? Yes, this is mostly for there people. Is, or, or for, for instance, somebody that you don't like gets access to the machine and starts sending your you don't your data, data. data. <laughs> right, just, adding data. We were just asking if you have the same type of model as before, but you said somebody's yeah. taking the device. Yeah, so yeah, there's, there, there's a lot of different threats here, and if you deal with that, you end up with it's like an only model where you've got multiple layers of security. Yeah, no, no, this is still very fun. We also want to make sure that once the platform is actually running, um, attacks don't, uh, um, we have some way to thwart a lot of vulnerabilities. For example, oh, we are running a DHCP client. Um, oh, now there's a vulnerability in the DHCP server or the DHCP client which allows remote code execution, um, which would be significantly thwarted with SE Linux because suddenly you can't escape because while in a data center, you can just say, oh, there's this severe vulnerability, let's just roll out patches to uh, uh, all systems over the next, I don't know, hour. If you have about 56 kilobytes or kilobits of data, that patching all the time, it might take a bit for the patches to actually sync out to all of your nodes. You still want them to be somewhat secure and not be remotely exploited immediately. Um, as part of that is also uh, IMA. I had to write it down because I always forget what it stands for. <laughs> um, it's a Linux kernel feature, which actually is now back enabled in Fedora Rawhide. It was enabled a while ago and then things blew up. Um, basically, it's a way where you can say, um, either this is the file content I expect and don't <coughs> load them if anything changes. So if you get a file uh, um, that someone manages to change on the disk, you can figure that out and not load it. Um, and that also ties into um, measurement because I may can also measure the files that are being read which can then be used in a later stage. So the operating system integrity for both um, making sure we, uh, uh, you always have the same image deployed and you know which image is booting. Uh, we're using RPM OS 3. Some of you might know it from Atomic or CoreOS, Fedora CoreOS, not the original one. Um, so then the connect time because you now have a platform running. And yeah, a platform on itself, I mean, 
I can put a computer on here, but it's not going to be of any use until I can actually connect to it, supposedly. Um, you do need connections, um, but how are we going to prevent someone from stealing the device, extracting keys from it, and then, oh, I can now connect to the VPN of the owner of this device um, and roam around in their network, because that is not really the intended purpose of things. Um, and I can tell you that this has happened in other deployments, probably not intended to be repeated. Um, so we intend to store the actual encryption key, or the, the authentication keys in a TPM, where you basically cannot extract the private key material out of it in order to uh, um, connect without that specific platform in a known good way. So only if that system has booted and has correctly verified its entire boot uh, uh, process can you get access to the keys to connect to the network. And as part of that also, all the measurements previously, we can use that to prove the remote server that we are in fact the correct machine with the correct platform software and yeah, now we can actually connect to a network. However, you still want to run an application. So we now have a platform where we can, where we know that what's running on a platform is secure. Um, the platform it, or the device can connect security to a remote network. But does that mean you trust everything? In a, no. in most systems, uh, this is basically the stack of the what you trust in a system, where each color means a different provider of the data or of the application or code. Um, you first have the CPU, which you need to trust, which runs Management Engine, for example, if you use Intel, um, which is already scary in itself. Then there's the EFI from Lenovo in my case. Um, do I trust them to write secure code? I don't. Um, well, and they're third party vendors. And oh, yeah. There's and oh. various random drivers that they've put in, pulled in from other third party vendors. Oh, the question is, do you yep. trust synaptics? Yeah, no. Like, you need to trust all, of, all kinds of different firmware. And then you also want to run an application. So these days, most of the time, you actually run things inside a virtual machine. Now you've got a hypervisor to trust. Inside that, you have another bootloader and another kernel in there, and container engine, for example, Docker, because everything is containers these days. And then you finally get to your user space, like your libc and other applications, and middleware. And then finally, you can run your own algorithm on it. Um, XKCD made a perfect summary of this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All layers you can basically assume are. I forgot about that. That is just yes, yes, the same diagram. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so this one got timed perfectly for uh, uh, the project we were working on. We were like, they just published this for us. So <laughs> some of you might have heard of Anarchs. One of the other core people is sitting right there, Peter Jones. Uh, <laughs> um, and he will probably bash me if I say anything wrong, so that's kind of scary. Nah. <laughs> He'll just troll you from the audience. Yeah, that's fine. So, the, rest of the, audience is the intention with uh, uh, Anarchs is that we basically say you get down to you trust the CPU and firmware because you need to run your application somewhere, and yeah, I. You've got to trust something. Yeah, you gotta trust something. And then you skip all the layers in between with what you need to verify because we run middleware or basically we have a application platform. And on top of that, you just run your application. I don't have any further slides, no. Uh, so the intention here is basically most modern CPUs architectures have a what's called a trusted Trusted execution environment, 
which is a specific mode of the CPU where even the host operating system cannot see or touch any of the code you are running. Um, for example, there's Intel SGX or AMD SEV. Sorry, distractions. Um, uh, uh, um, so there's Intel SGX, AMD SEV. Both of them are a way to run an application on your CPU where all of your host operating system is not able to actually see it. Um, so the intention here is to be able to run an application as a we shove it inside SGX or AMD SEV and you don't have to trust any intermediate layers and you just get a connection via a secure protocol and whatever you run in there is invisible to the host operating system. So whatever malware you have in running in there will have no clue what is going on or be unable to tamper with it. So that is how we are hoping to get some trustworthiness of your results and the platform you run things on. So, yeah, we, we assume no physical security and then in, try to ensure integrity from there on for the platform connection and then later the actual applications and are there any further questions? You mentioned uh, the verification of the images for the RPMI tree. That's a feature maybe I haven't heard promoted quite as much for something like, say, uh, Silverboard RPMI tree. Can you talk a little bit more about how the image verification works or what you're mentioning about? Right. So, RPMI tree is. Uh, um, when you deploy a tree, you deploy a particular commit. That commit is signed by the, the distributor, Fedora, uh, for example, and it f uh, contains the checksum of every single file that is shipped as part of that tree. So while you're pulling the image down and also later at runtime, you can verify that everything that you downloaded and or put on disk is exactly as it was shipped um, at any point in time. And in addition, um, that um, the uh, uh, root file system is also mounted read only. So it is also very hard to actually modify it and then also to detect, uh, um, it is then also possible to detect if it has been modified. This one or no, 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 to the clavis, the panels. Oh, yeah. yes. Um, so you, you want to use this for the root file system encryption? Or yeah. 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 And I kind of like I'm struggling with the fact that um, the, again it's kind of the same question as before. Uh, before you were saying I'm worried that somebody could steal the device and everything, so I'm protecting it with encryption. It sounds like to me as an idea of observation that here you have both the encrypted part and the key. Correct. The TPM on the same system that is being stolen away. Yes. So what is... Um, however, the TPM itself, like the core feature of a TPM is that it's really hard to get or basically impo practically impossible to get its key material out of it. Yeah, but, but um, so and you can tell the TPM that it will only release its keys, so be well, able to decrypt the disk. <laughs> Sorry? It won't release its keys. Right. No, but like that it will only use its keys to decrypt your root file system if everything up to there is booted with correct material. So if you were to pull out the uh, kernel and uh, uh, try to pull, put in an attacker kernel which locks the passphrase or something, um, the TPM doesn't have the correct measurements and then it won't decrypt the disk encryption key. Yeah, no, but that's, again, like, that's not the case. Like, 
have stolen the whole device. Let's yes, and so if yeah, you but steal the whole device and you go and plug it in somewhere else, and you don't change anything on that device, it will still blow up. The encryption is as well. You know, that's fine. It's like, then they have to decrypt the device. Well, live. No, but it, yeah, so, yeah. You have, to go so. Back and steal, you have to go back and steal a second one because you just took the drive out of the first one, right? Yeah, like if you take the drive yeah, out, you can't do that won't because it won't. won't. You can power it up somewhere else and you could access the device, say, via a terminal compromise or something else well, to get access to a running device that has the thing decrypted. Okay. But it is like as I said, it's an onion. You you like you can have, you can set it up in such a way that with the IMA infrastructure, that if something is then changed on the device, you can have a daemon that blows it away and secure wipes it and various so other things. So let's back up and ask this the other way. What's the threat model you're wondering about? The one that you chose What's the threat model? The one that you started with, like my threat model is if somebody steals the device. That's, that's not a threat model. But that's that's, that's a scenario. scenario, but it's not a threat model. The question is what you're trying to prevent them from doing with it. So if someone, like, if someone steals the device and they hook it up to their own power and network, it will just boot. But that, that, that doesn't bite them anything because they don't, the system is still so like standard locked down. Like you don't have a terminal because you don't have a root password. You just have a heater. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it will yeah, still just heater. do, it still runs, and don't have It still take one interesting operation so the only so the only result yeah. there is that if if you steal the device and you plug it into your home, the only result is that the person who owns the device doesn't have to power the electricity bill anymore because you just run it for them with their software. <laughs> and in fact, that's one of the things we thought about using Neon for. Right, it's one one of the deployment models. <laughs> um, the main thing is uh, um, if you actually want to read what's on the disk. Um, like you would need the exact same disk and the exact same device with the exact same bootloader and the exact same kernel, which supposedly we we secure. Like the TPM ensures that you boot the same bootloader and the same kernel. Um, in which case, yeah, we're we're hoping that the kernel isn't totally compromised. You basically have a login screen that you can yeah. try. Yeah, like and possibly the network you can try it. Like, I mean, there's, there's attack surfaces yes. there, but not. So just like the attack surfaces. Moving the physical device is, is, is perfectly fine as well. Yeah, as long as you, like, you just get to foot the electricity bill. <laughs> but there have been conversations that we've had with some people about, well, what if you add GPS to this equation and the GPS shows up somewhere else? Yeah, no, no, we just, again, we're just confused because oh, right. before you were saying my yeah, the, the, right, so the idea there is that we want to protect against other people extracting either key material so able to connect to other devices or <laughs> algorithms out of the device. Um, the physical device ourselves, we assume is going to be stolen. Yeah, so you block down the device, so the one way you off the disk that is in. If you take that disk out and put it in another machine, they're not a good buy. Um, yeah. and, and so you can't put the device say, off a USB key to get access to that. Um, and then, you know, the, and then things like the VPN credentials to connect in to say the data network where it's pushing the data to it is also stored in the TPM, so they're not recovered. So like you may end up in a scenario where all the stuff that is actually stored on that disk, even though it is encrypted, is of no use to you anymore. And if you're concerned about the data on the device, you might write, say, a watchdog plot that scrubs the disk if it doesn't check in on the right, right network often enough. But that's not but that's the that's that's extra thing. So is this use? Is this uh, it boots off of a removable storage, but it's got flash on board and it uses the removable? This well, is it doesn't. It, it could be removable. Really really it doesn't matter what the storage. So, so Travis literally sure. gives us a, a, a map of here are the devices here. Here's how you put them together in terms of 
the crypto, what, what do, you, do you need it? This kind of signature plus this kind of signature is policy for how, you, how, how is it going to be authenticated? How is it going to be decrypted? Sure. So okay. it, it's stackable level. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. A different question, which is, uh, is the update story of this IP stuff out of scope for this part? Or? Um, it is totally in scope for Fedora IoT. It was mostly out of scope for the security part because a lot of that is playing what we currently have for RPM OS 3, um, which pulls down the deltas and then verifies it there. Um, I try to focus more on how do we ensure like that our intellectual property isn't stolen and that people don't get access to our data. But we will focus on it just in a different context. Any other questions? Thanks for your attention.